So when we change our energy system, we have to ask where the energy comes from and who's actually leading in, in terms of producing the new equipment we need to harness that uh, source of energy. And I think if you look around the world today, the answer who is leading the energy transition in business terms is fundamentally obvious. It's China. China is uh, you know, the leading producer of renewable energy equipment on which companies and governments spend money to implement uh, the energy transition, as it were. Uh, and, and they're also leading in areas like mobility, you know, with electric vehicles. So it's pretty clear that geopolitics is going to loom large when you have to do this transition. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm talking to Dr. Kingsley Jones, who is a founding partner and CIO for Chevens Global, an Australian-based investment firm. Before running his own company, Dr. Jones has been serving for many years as a portfolio manager and the head for quantitative trading research units in various other firms. In short, Dr. Jones is a professional analyst and one who pays a lot of attention to geopolitical impacts on global markets. Today we want to discuss something that has been flying somewhat under the radar and that he pointed out to me, namely the nexus between this fundamental shift that we are seeing at the moment. On the one hand, an energy transition away from fossil fuels, and on the other hand, a power transition uh, in international geopolitics away from you know, the Western-centered liberal capitalism, if that's the right thing to call it. But we want to bring that together today. Uh, Dr. John Jones, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, Pascal. I very much enjoy watching your videos at Neutrality Studies. So, uh, you know, it's great to meet you in person and have a good chat. And it's great talking to you because there's, there's not many analysts who try to use geopolitics in markets, although, of course, everybody has to use it a little bit. But I think for you, it's your bread and butter, um, as you've been telling me before before the, the chat a bit, that you try to look at the, the large picture also for long-term investment. And, you know, it needs to be very concrete, though, right? Because you do, you do actual investment. So um, why do you think that... This has been underappreciated that we are also seeing energy transition happening um, while the, the geopolitical system is changing. Yeah, look, that's a really, really great rabbit hole to go down, we think, because energy transition is accepted. We're moving from fossil fuels. Uh, we need new sources of energy, whether it's renewable energy like solar and wind and tidal and hydro and other things. Or, or it's, uh, you know, perhaps it's nuclear at the margin or, or even some new ideas that have yet to really be progressed. So the energy transition is a big thing. It's accepted. So it's a valid question. Why on earth would that relate to geopolitics? And the fact that we're seeing all this geopolitical change right now, you know, is it, we can't think really about causes, but is there a reason why these two things are related? And from an investment perspective, I very much think that the answer to that is yes. Uh, that these two things are related, and they are so for a very, very simple economic reason. When you have the energy system, remember that powers our machines. We, we as humans, we we need food for our labour, but for any sort of machines, whether it's uh, you know a tractor or a car or a factory, uh, they need energy, and indeed data warehouses need energy also, as we're seeing with AI. So when we change our energy system, we have to ask where the energy comes from and who's actually leading in, in terms of producing the new equipment we need to harness that uh, source of energy. And I think if you look around the world today, the answer who is leading the energy transition in business terms is fundamentally obvious. It's China. China is uh, you know, the leading producer of renewable energy equipment on which companies and governments spend money to implement uh, the energy transition, as it were. Uh, and, and they're also leading in areas like mobility, you know, with electric vehicles. So it's pretty clear that geopolitics is going to loom large when you have to do this transition. And there's, you know, the new kid on the block, very old country, resurgent as an economy, China, thinking about the world in different ways, doing business in different ways, having a different form of government and being the supplier of this new form of energy. 
uh, at scale. And that's a huge challenge. And that's why we see the energy and power transition as being related. You know, it's been interesting to me that the the Biden administration, but even before him, uh, the Trump administration in the US in general, is very keen on projecting this image that if we if we just cut China well enough off Western markets, especially in uh, high technology and in, in microchip uh, the, uh, in technology, which is fundamentally lithography technology, it's not the chips, it's the, the machines that make the chips that, you, that, that they're trying to restrict to them, then problem will be solved. You know, China won't be able to rise any further. But now you're saying that's not even it. It's the, it's the energy dummy. Yeah, we would say that. I mean, we'll have a, a, a think about what you raise there with chips in a moment. But yeah, look, it's the energy dummy because, uh, you know, otherwise the lights go out. And, um, you know, we're seeing that in Australia now. I'll just give you a little example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, and the sort of thinking that, you know, appears uh, in uh, the political sphere uh, once you have these geopolitical challenges. So obviously Australia's got huge renewable energy uh, resources. We get so much sun, you know, we, we get a lot of wind. Um, but we don't really have a major solar industry and certainly not a major wind industry in terms of producing the equipment. Uh, so we import all of that from China, or most of it. Um, there's about a very tiny share of Australian production of solar panels uh, domestically. And, and, you know, China is, you know, really the price leader and increasingly the quality leader in this area. So Australia has, you know, little choice but to buy this from China right now. Um, but, you know, that, that then kind of makes people worry and say, well, are we too reliant on China? I don't know. They're reliant on us. You know, we send them all the iron ore. We, they're our biggest trading partner. You know, we get about almost $100 billion of export revenues in minerals uh, with uh, commodities sold to China, uh, you know, iron ore and lithium and, and nickel and other commodities. Um, so, you know, you have to ask the question, are we really at risk that China would cut us off from solar energy supplies if we could cut them off from iron ore and other things? Probably not. Not among sensible people. If you have a, you know, a sensible diplomatic relationship with another country that's a major trading partner, you should be able to manage those risks. But look, here's the kicker. You know, in Australia, because, you know, China is the, you know, the, uh, you know, the big elephant, as it were, in, in, in the Asia Pacific room, uh, our lot politicians start to worry about this. So now we have to subsidize to massive amounts of money, you know, measured in billions, the creation of, of new solar plants in the Hunter Valley. And uh, they're not going to be economic, I don't think, um, under any feasible scenario. But nonetheless, we're going to spend this money to set them up. And of course, once they lose money, we'll almost certainly then have to raise tariffs and put those on Chinese imports, which kind of defeats the whole purpose, you see. Um, and this is how, you know, the geopolitics, the power transition, yeah, China's powerful, we need to talk to them. Uh, the energy transition and our own domestic situation are closely related. And I believe that's replicated in many countries. But can we, uh, apart from the fact that in the West, we unfortunately are not blessed with a lot of sensible leaders, but let's set that aside for a moment. Um, the How do you see that the fact that China is now leading this new form of harnessing energy um, that that interlinks with the power play of of um, with the U.S. and now also with maybe with Russia, you know the the the, the geopolitics of it all. Because like uh, energy is 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 uh, you, you're absolutely right. It's often a driver for geopolitical decisions. The whole reason why the Japanese went south in the Second World War was to get to the oil in Indonesia because they were running out of oil because the U.S. cut them off of their oil. And that was a casus belli, basically. Uh, so the, the energy and access to energy drives geopolitical thinking. Um, it, now, in the case of renewable energy, how do you think it drives geopolitical decisions, let's say, in China and the U.S.? Yeah, look, that's totally fascinating, um, you know, historical link to ponder, I think. That's such a rich vein uh, to examine, uh, you know, the reasons why Japan entered the war in the Second World War, you know, with being blockaded from energy supplies by the United States, uh, and then seeking, you know, within, you know, the structure, not not to excuse what happened, but but within the imperial structure that then existed for the government of Japan, uh, they were presented with a specific problem, 
how do we get you know energy and fuel not only for the military but but just for society in general to operate how do we get that when we've been cut off from it um and you know we see this play out now i mean you mentioned earlier the semiconductor sanctions and um you know we'll elaborate on that later but but with the semiconductor sanctions you know you have a um to me personally as an investor uh, a quite shocking parallel with the pre world war 2 era with japan uh you know um the surprise attack on on the united states at pearl harbor because ultimately of of their ambitions but also the fact that they've been cut off from energy uh, and here you have the united states trying to cut china off from semiconductors um you know under the stated rationale that this is for national security reasons but let's remember that semiconductors are used in a host of different things um including electric vehicles in order to operate them as machinery and you know your standard electric vehicle is not a piece of military hardware you know it, it's to get from a to b it's it's uh you know it's mostly civilian purchasing of evs um and civilians driving them to to go about their ordinary work day uh, and and here in australia of course um you know the leading supplier of electric vehicles to australia is china so let's relate all these things together so you you mentioned uh, you know in the trump uh, presidency you know the initial fears oh we we need to contain china we'll do this and do that um and and then putting tariffs to keep evs out of the united states so you know that's a reverse move to like the sanctions on china to prevent them getting semiconductors and, and you know if it stopped there then maybe that wouldn't be a problem but but if you're trying to prevent china from developing its own semiconductors and you're not allowing them to buy them and they're so essential to evs then we see how this energy transition this power transition of of sort of collided as it were and become one wicked problem um you know if you think about it from the perspective of china um in any country the automobile uh industry if if they have one um is very important look at germany and europe um in or japan for auto manufacturing it's a, it's a big part of their economy so if you're preventing a, a country that as actually the leading source of autos you know china is the biggest auto producer worldwide by mm-hmm. by numbers and units if you're preventing them from acquiring the chips they need to make those autos then you know you're creating a a very very difficult situation economically and politically and one wonders how that helps national security to create that sort of conundrum and so again you're seeing the energy transition collide with the power transition as it were yeah the <coughs> sorry the the thing with both of these is that there are um technology issues uh energy used to be a you know a, a typical ge- a typically geopolitical issue because either you have in your own territory access to these carbon <coughs> carbo uh, hydrates or yeah. um not hydrates carbo um hydrocarbons yeah. hydrocarbons thank you carbohydrates are the ones we eat hydrocarbons are the ones we burn <laughs> <laughs> that's so great yeah our energy carbohydrates machines yeah and yeah. yeah. I, i always mix them up anyhow so hydrocarbons are you either have them on your soil or you don't and if you don't you need to trade them you need to get access to them or you need to go and take them <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 pretty simple but now we are seeing a a change the change of that in the sense that if you have the technology uh to to build something you can harness it because the sun shines on god's green earth everywhere right um so do you is that something that you believe would impact the decision making although uh, to 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 be fair like not everything can be run on on electricity right i've never seen a military plane or a or a tank running on electricity it's hard to imagine i mean for certain uh, certain machines will always need hydrocarbons Yeah, I think that's fair. And shipping's another good example. You know, there's just so much energy required to move a ship over long distances. Uh, you know, be be a shame if you're a battery powered ship and you got lower. <laughs> you got down, <laughs> you got down to one bar in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of stuff then. Um, yeah, so look, um noting that fact, um if we pick up that thread, I think what's interesting and the reason why historically when we've had an energy transition and this is not the first one right so you know go back to to the stone age and discovery of fire <laughs> you know the, you know turning turning trees into into heat 
you know, to stay warm and cook and so on was is perhaps the first energy transition. And then many since, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, we had coal. And I think the connection here is that it doesn't really matter what the energy source is. When it changes, when you need, because of the physics involved, because um, it's all physics at the end of the day, um, uh, you need a machine of some kind, if you want to call it that, uh, to convert the energy we find in nature, whether it's a carbohydrate for our digestive system uh, as food, or it's a hydrocarbon for, you know, the digestive system of an automobile, which is an internal combustion engine, um, or it's electricity, yeah, um, to put in a battery. Now, uh, we need machines to do that. And clearly uh, for solar, you need solar panels and there's technology involved in that. But there's also manufacturing know-how. Um, there's raw materials, there's manufacturing know-how. And with the manufacturing know-how, there's also intellectual property. And so the fascinating thing today, you know, if you think, for example, what, what you mentioned, um, you know, with President Donald Trump, you know, that there was this uh, idea, well, United States is the greatest nation on earth. We've heard that from Joe Biden um, recently. We're the greatest nation on earth. We can't fail at anything. You know, we are the leader. Um, therefore, if we... Um, if we can prevent, you know, the great unwashed out there who want what we have from getting our know-how and our technology by stopping them from receiving it, then they'll just wither and die because without us, they there's no possibility they could ever innovate and move forward. Uh, and so th this is a very simplistic idea that ought not to find currency in the modern world. <laughs> No. And in what and in and it won't. We are seeing right now that the Chinese have been uh, uh, making significant uh, advances yeah. in their own domestic chips manufacturing, and as you said, like the the solar panels, and this then creates new ways for China to interact with with Russia and with other BRICS states and nations. And and do you think that this the fact that we have the power transi the uh, the great power transition <laughs> will also now lead to a spread of of this technology or do you still think that countries like china at the end of the day will still um, guard these these technology technologies very jealously or will they proliferate over the BRICS block that that's a that's a very interesting question and uh you know if i answer it with my kind of investment strategist hat on you know because is that very often this is the issue, right? Look at company X, company Y, company Z. Uh, look, look at the industry dynamics and then ask yourself the question, you know, what's the natural strategy for the incumbent? You know, business as usual, keep the competitors out. Um, what, what's the natural strategy for a challenger? You know, be disruptive, do things differently, try the things that haven't been tried. But most importantly, in recent history with technology, because this is really the key thing, You'll note that one of the most impregnable seeming, um, you know, examples of monopoly dominance in tech, specifically in computing, was the Wintel duopoly, you know, um, Intel microchips and Microsoft operating system back in the 90s. And it looked absolutely impregnable. There's no way we'll ever beat these guys. You know, they've got it sewn up. Well, that's before the lawyers get involved with antitrust. But, but let's put that to one side. Um, you know, the, the community of technology developers went full throttle on disruption once the Linux operating system arrived. So that was open source and that was collaborative. That was a case of sharing the tools, as it were, as the barbarians. You know, you're not the civilised people. You're not Redmond. Um, you're not Bill Gates. You're not the richest guy in the world. You're the uncivilised people outside the city ramparts, the Linux developers, you know, attempting to lay waste to the citadel and, and, and you claim the prize within. So the natural thing to do is collaborate, cooperate and share things. Um, and my view is that China's fundamental motivation in this area is to do just that, to share. Uh, and we can see examples of that with some of their leading technology companies. So, for example, if you look at the early days of Huawei before it actually got sanctioned, Uh, they had sent up R&D centres all around the world. In fact, Australia's then only leading R&D centre for telecommunications technology was based in Melbourne and it was a Huawei operation. <laughs> and, and, and when we sanctioned them, they had to close it. <clears throat> uh, 
And then all the engineers who worked at that facility got fired and most of them had to emigrate because there was no other place in Australia they could work. Um, so, so if you think about what China's been doing historically, um, you know, they, they've actually been doing the reverse of what, what many allege, which is trying to keep all their cards close to the chest. No, what they've been doing is actually going out into the world and trying to harness um, resources uh, on the ground in those countries uh, that ultimately they, they are clearly competing with, um, but, but also looking to open as markets. Um, now, of course, with Huawei, that's, that's ended. But if you look at contemporary Amperex technology, which is the leading lithium-ion battery maker worldwide, which is based in China, um, you know, they, they have a fairly open technology strategy. Now, this doesn't mean they, they give it away, but what it means is if you want to work with cattle, they'll, they'll happily collaborate with you to apply their battery know-how in your manufactured product on appropriate and non-restrictive licensing terms, as in let's do a commercial deal. Uh, we're very open to do business. And um, this is not being very successful in the United States. I mean, they, they did such a deal with Ford, Ford Motor Company, because it made commercial sense for Ford when they wanted to build uh, a battery plant in the United States uh, to, to, to go uh, license cattle technology because there's no real US automaker that has good technology in this area apart from Tesla. And even Tesla license and, and use, you know, BYD and cattle battery technology. Excuse me. <clears throat> so Ford wanted to set up a, a battery plant, um, did the licenses with cattle and the agreements and so on. But then, you know, the politics in the United States <laughs> at uh, the federal level sort of intervened and then there's state politics and then pretty soon... There's all these parties, you know, the, 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 the uh, how can I put this, the, um, the, the flaming torches come out and the pitchforks um, and people say, we don't want this factory here. Why? In the because US. Uses, mm. Yeah, because it uses Chinese technology. So that's what you're seeing in the United States, but you don't see that phenomenon in Brazil. You don't see that phenomenon. This is the global south, right? And, and isn't it odd? You know, we mentioned categories earlier. So Hungary, is Hungary part of the global south? <laughs> Why do we use the term South? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I need to explain. Just before we started filming, we were like talking about the hypocrisy of the West and how uh, anyone who's good counts as a uh, part of the liberal democracies, even if you're Saudi Arabia. Uh, and anyone who doesn't go along, like Hungary, is immediately deemed uh, autocratic yeah. in the making, right? <laughs> but that's yeah. the context, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the summary point of view here is within that framing of you know, this uh, existential struggle between the, the good Democrats and the evil autocrats. Um, and, you know, the assumption underlying that is that, oh, well, of course, Democrats innovate and cooperate and collaborate and autocrats can't innovate because they're autocratic. They, they you know, by definition, autocracy has one person telling everybody what to do. So how could you be innovative if you're being told what to do? And it's just a complete um, kind of... Um, oversimplification it's a nonsense it's it's utter nonsense i mean obviously <laughs> obviously these these cent relatively centrally governed systems like china but also vietnam and, and russia too now they have developed beautifully i mean they they have they have functioning yeah. working economies but so um since you're an investor and since you have to um also work and and know a lot about different um investment environments i would actually like to know this from you like the the risks of investing into technology development in china versus mm -hmm. the risk of investing into uh technology development in the united states because both of these both of them as you just said in the us too you might just sink a lot of money into something that in the end blows up uh and from china i've heard that the chinese um, are famous for basically pro uh, very protectionist markets that make it very hard for for foreign um innovators but also investors what's your what can you tell us about that yeah look that's a great um comparison so starting from the top uh in the united states which does have a, a pretty sound innovation system i i think that and it's not a protectionist market um you know at least not superficially but if you think about technology now it's a it's a market 
that's that's open yeah tick um not protectionist well not very um although it's moving that way um and so you could say well what's the risk of in investing in, in technology well don't invest in in companies that are small <laughs> <laughs> don't don't invest in companies that are competing with Nvidia. Don't invest in companies that are competing with Microsoft. Don't invest in companies that are competing with Amazon. Don't invest in companies that are competing with Alphabet or Apple. Yeah, because they're I mean, they're 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 the dominant markets. Um... Because they're the dominant, they are the autocrats of this market. Mm. Um, and if you don't do what they tell you to, um, you're stuffed. Um, and indeed, if you're in such a company, um, they 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 obviously practice an open management style um, but if you think about it it's a pretty regimented thing in terms of what that company will allow you to do so, and, and it's pretty and it's pretty mono monopolized in each of these sectors right. right there are there is competition but you know uh, genuine competition looks different <laughs> than when you have uh, uh, companies that that manage uh, uh, entire yeah. ecosystems um but on the, the this is something that Ben Norton keeps pointing out really China is the only other country on earth that has reached uh, digital sovereignty um it yeah. has counter products to all the all the products that that fundamentally the US offers to to the Western uh, allies and everything right um but investment into those would actually run the same risks as to the investment into the United States as an outsider right I mean they operate under very similar oh, yeah, uh, conditions right. yeah so Huawei will be pretty dominant in the Chinese market for example as our cattle and BYD. And in this environment where you see um, large government subsidies on offer, in China I'm talking about, um, for the chip industry, for example. Um, now that that doesn't mean that there won't be new entrants that, that, that grab some of that. And there's obviously going to be a very non-transparent political process about how you persuade a local, you know, Communist Party leader of the, of the city of Shenzhen or, or wherever it happens to be, Why, why you should be one of the anointed ones who get some money. Where there'll be there'll be a lot of glad hiding and process there, right? Um, in terms of getting the money, uh, but the money is available. The, the thing is that the I think the Communist Party of China and the associated government, um, which has many different levels, and and I think it's unwise to assume that, as yeah, some do, that you know Xi Jinping wakes up in the morning and tells everybody what to do. That's that's not really how contemporary China works. And it was not how dynastic China worked either, I would say. Um, but but if you think about the dynamics, then the risks um, in China is firstly, the risk of either within or outside China in, in terms of technology investment is that you don't invest. <laughs> yeah. Because that they, they have a huge innovation system, so many scientists and engineers And scientists who are now operating at a truly global standard and doing new things all the time. Uh, you see this in the lithium ion battery space, and you also see it in solar panels. Uh, you know, to give you an example, Longyear Energy, which is one of the solar panel leaders, you know, they're really out in front on perovskite uh, solar cells, which is a new technology of high efficiency, with significant manufacturing problems to solve to get it to production. But they have the scale to be able to fund and do that R&D. So the short version of this is that in China, the biggest risk is not being invested in technology, whether you are within China or outside of China, because under the current policy settings and the strategic competition with the United States, there is enormous dynamism within China to get as fast as possible to the leading edge of manufacturing technologies of all kinds. And that's before you get into this contested digital sphere. Um, and, and I think from outside of China, the standard rhetoric is, well, this is all about the, the PLA and the military. And I, I think that's nonsense. Um, the biggest driver within China is the dog-eat-dog -dog world of commerce. Um, the what? You know, if you, Sorry. The dog-eat-dog -dog world of commerce. You know, just the brutal competition. Just look at the brutal competition in electric vehicles. You know, th th this, is, this is not one state champion, you know, with a spigot of cash in the side and cars pouring out the other. There are state-owned enterprises in China, um, but they're finding it very difficult to survive against the, um, the privately-owned new entrants. Um, 
And, and so the competition in the largest auto market in the world, which is China, with the largest number of electric vehicle you know, contenders for the prize, is just fierce. Hmm. Um, it is absolutely fierce. And the pace of innovation is truly incredible. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Tesla owner. I, I bought a Tesla Model 3 about 18 months ago in Australia. And when I look at the dashboard of it now, it looks tired. It's, it looks it's, tired. It really? looks tired. It's like a 1950s Morris. <laughs> um, when you look inside, you look, I, I get inside it uh, having, you know, seen the interiors of cars coming out of China now. Um, and I, I, I say to myself, it's, as an investor, this wouldn't be a popular view in the United States, but as an investor, I just stay away from Tesla stock because mm. they've lost this race. Um, their capacity to innovate and keep up with consumer demand, because remember, if you were, if you were Chinese, I mean, I'm not Chinese, obviously, but, but if you were Chinese and had grown up in China through this period of the tremendous transformation of the market, you would have grown up buying all kinds of indifferent, poor quality products that broke the first time you used them <laughs> at low mm -hmm. prices. And, and so your early experience as a Chinese person was one of immense frustration with Chinese products because <laughs> they kept bragging on you or they didn't know what they were supposed to do or they were fake or they were this or they were that, right? Um, but now in the, in the well, not the biggest population that's India, but but close to in in this particular commercial market in China, you have literally hundreds of millions of people whose life experience is to immediately reject anything that's crap <laughs> as a product. Pardon my French, um, and 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 go find the thing that's good. And so the Chinese themselves, if you listen to Chinese leaders and companies that are Private companies, not 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 following the dictates of of the uh, central government, other than what they need to stay in business, um, they will tell you that the biggest issue in China is satisfying the consumer, because these are the most demanding consumers on earth. Um, and so, if you can satisfy a Chinese consumer, it follows you can satisfy anybody anywhere. Mm. This yeah. is the thing. And this is the risk of not investing in technology in China. It, it, it is so interesting. And I just need to point out, I mean, we are not doing any kind of uh, uh, investment uh, sure. uh, uh, um, advice, right? This is not investment advice. We are just talking about... No, so my personal opinion as a Tesla owner, I wouldn't yeah. buy the stock. <laughs> On the car, not the stock. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this is what's fascinating to me, you know, that this idea that because China is a officially communist country, um, it all it does is it, it can copy, but it cannot innovate. And that that idea seems to be very stuck, even in in the heads of some policymakers in the West. And then it leads to these stupid decisions of of, of putting sanctions and believing that this will that that this will solve problems. When in fact, and, and it, this was a, a, a Chinese uh, uh, academic who pointed that out, but I forgot his name. Uh, but he pointed out, you know, China is a uh, market economy but not a capitalist country because in capitalist countries capital controls or has significant influence over uh, the political process and that's what they don't have the political process governs what the what the economy is doing and not, not the other way around but still the economy is structured since Deng Xiaoping as a market economy it's like okay you guys do you guys go compete and the best gets to the top and then you 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 compete further so they use the model and the model is producing obviously now for 30 years it it's it's funny to me that it, it seems so difficult for the west to wrap its head around that which then means if you if you break trading links well, the Chinese are just going to figure out how to do it differently because they can <laughs> because they yeah. can <laughs> yeah you know the the water finds its course yeah. natural course it, it will it will move around well you know that that's a great metaphor i mean we know um you know, one of the most powerful forces is in nature is is water, because mm -hmm. it it's formless. It, you know, it will just change. It has its own nature, but it finds its own path through gravity. 
And then in freezing conditions, it can fracture rocks and move mountains and reduce them to rubble. Um, and I think it's, you, you make an excellent point. And if I could now sort of maybe amplify on, you know, the energy and power transition into what psychologically happens when you have such conditions, then I think what you get is the makings of identity crises of different kinds. Mm. So, so these powerful geopolitical forces, because politics is involved, and let's remember politics is all about how do I as a politician appeal to voters if I'm, I'm in a democracy, or if I'm an autocratic leader, how do I stay in power by, you know, not upsetting so many people um, that, you know, that, that they force me out, right, in a coup or other means, whatever means. Or in, in, in dynastic China, getting poisoned, you know, <laughs> something like that. Um, so if you, if you think about this issue, there is an identity crisis which involves how our psyche, how the way we think about the world adjusts to a change that at some point we recognise we can't control. In the West, I believe, is undergoing an identity crisis about what it means to be Western, um, if it mm. means anything at all. I mean, the West is not a homogeneous block. I mean, you, you, I think you spend most of your time in Japan. Is Japan part of the West? To me, it has always been the most Eastern part of the West because it feels like that. Uh, yeah. It. But it, it's also, it's, it's by choice, it's by design. The Japanese uh, 150 years ago, 160 years yeah. ago, 70 years ago, chose yeah. to, to like, okay, let's, let's decouple from, from the continent and just start imitating the Americans and the, and the Europeans. And it chose today. They do it in their own way, but it is yeah. very much structured like yeah. that. It, it, life feels different, actually, in, already like in, 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 in Taiwan. And in Southeast yep. Asia, for sure, it feels like a, a, a very different vibe. But in, I mean, yep. in this sense, then that's why Japan, I will call it too, the collective West when we yep. put it together. Although Japan is very, very brilliant in, uh, in it, making the others believe that it does the same thing while actually doing something completely different. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> Flying under the hood. Yeah. <laughs> Again, without providing investment advice, uh, that's why we're heavily invested in Japan. Yeah, because uh, they, they straddle the mountain, as it were. Um, they're, yeah. they're able to navigate these different worlds. But that brings me to one more, uh, another question that I had on my mind earlier, but I would like to ask you now is um, the, 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 the change, the geopolitical change is also leading to new, it's leading to restrictions on the one hand in terms of what, what, it, what is being traded or what the US would like to see not traded. But it is leading to new trade flows inside the blocks. I mean, there's this whole concept of friend sharing. And now we are suddenly seeing uh, Taiwanese critical uh, technologies from the chip manufacturer, TMC, being uh, they're building now a factory in Japan, you know, uh, instead of producing locally because they want to diversify the risk of the geopolitical risk. That's it. You want to have a plant outside of, a, of, of striking range of the, of the uh, still in striking range of the Chinese, but it, it might not be a primary target. Right. And um, and this is now leading to to new to new uh, um, diversification, actually, of of of, of trading and, and uh, using also technology. Um, how do you think that will continue and what will be the impact of this new trading um, environment? I think it's it's really the main game. Um, so there are many that have said uh, in this sort of uh, era that you might mark with the first Trump administration is when it got serious uh, with trade restrictions emanating from the US um, that, that, you know, globalization was dead, you know, all, whatever. Um, if you look at the composition of trade, so picking up your point about the adjustment of trade flows, um, Globalization is not dead at all. In fact, it's continuing. Um, you know, global trade as a share of the global economy, of, of, of GDP, I believe, is still rising. It's just that it's falling in some places and rising in others. And one of the major uh, effects that's happening is, you know, the rebirth of a of the of the notion of an entrepot uh, country. You know, entrepot's an old word meaning, you know, um, a place where traders meet and exchange goods. Uh, and those goods and services, they might not actually be manufactured in the trading centre. Um, what makes the trading centre function is its central role in trade routes. Uh, it's a place where people can meet. And you see this, you can, you can always finger these, these locations because uh, if you look at their external trade, 
the external trade is often a multiple of their GDP. Mm. So if you looked in finance, that would be Switzerland, yeah? Um, or Singapore and... Singapore in goods Hong and Kong. finance. Hong Kong. And, you know, some people have written Hong Kong off. I would say, don't write Hong Kong off. It's going to be resurgent and much more powerful and important in the future for a very simple reason. Hong Kong's a classic entrepot community and has mm. been, you know, for forever. Of course, there have been political troubles there. Uh, but a good friend of mine said, Hong Kong people, they don't care about uh, politics. They care about commerce. So so as long as the politicians leave them alone enough, they'll get on with business. Um, and so under this new uh, world where if you think about it, what's actually happened is something quite simple. It used to be that Hong Kong was where a Western multinational went to interface with China, which has closed capital controls, so they could do business in China. Now, a lot of those Western firms have left. So who will be the new people that come to Hong Kong to replace them? It'll be the mainland Chinese multinationals seeking to escape the capital controls in China that need a dollar basis economy through the Hong Kong peg to do business with the rest of the world and then manage their repatriation through the capital control system back into the mainland. So Hong Kong hasn't lost its role at all. In fact, its role has amplified and become even more important. So, um, you know, we, we think that uh, there was a necessary adjustment as people thought, well, how far is this political repression going to go in Hong Kong when clearly the, the Chinese government got concerned that they might have separatist ambitions or democratic ambitions or, or whatever, right? And so they cracked down very hard. Now it seems to have moderated to the point where, well, let's not go too crazy. This is very valuable to the Chinese authorities to have Hong Kong as a functioning centre of trade. I think they'll probably relax a little bit more now because, in fact, what's going to happen is Chinese multinationals will be pressuring the Chinese government to, to relax these controls so that they can do business with other countries that pleases the Chinese central government. So Hong Kong trading with Brazil, Hong Kong trading with, you mentioned Hungary, Hong Kong trading with Malaysia and Vietnam and Singapore and Australia, all kinds of places. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite important. And again, it's like the stupid narrative from uh, of the West that kind of clouds the, the, the understanding <clears throat> that makes you believe that Hong Kong was completely integrated into China and it's the same now. No, yeah. they still have a special regulatory system that is different from mainland China. The one thing That's China right. did is it built a little bridge, a legal bridge yep. that makes it possible for them to take out anyone they want who, who might be doing like uh, separatist movements or That's whatever. Right. That's all they did. But the rest they didn't actually yep. touch until 2047 or 2049. Yep. Hong Kong still has special separate law, uh, especially right. governing the, the, the yep. business sector. Yeah. And, and so, you know, if you think about it from the perspective of someone who's doing business internationally, uh, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not saying um, such people should ignore the political situation in Hong Kong, or you know, not advocate for what they think is um, a better way uh, for the central government in China to um, manage. You know, the the Hong Kong question, right? However, you choose to frame the question. Um, but but what I am saying is that, and it comes back to the power transition. Yeah, what what I'm what I'm identifying in Hong Kong is. Hong Kong was important throughout history because of its port mm. and, and similarly Macau, um, you know, and, and we, we identify these, these two, uh, although they're adjacent, we identify them differently because they were historically in the hands of different mercantile powers that were seeking to use them for trade, you know, whether it's Portuguese or it's the, or it's the British. And if we remember how the connection from Hong Kong into mainland China first became prominent, it was mm. through the ignoble means of, of um, some, some interests, you know, from what we now call the West, um, seeking to sell opium into China. Um, yeah, and fight, know, fighting two wars, fighting two wars for the right to sell opium to Chinese people. Yeah. 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 So um, if you reverse, if you, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. Yeah. So if you invert that, just, just because we're now talking about a power transition where China becomes more important in global trade than it was then, yeah, 
in, in terms of trade external to Chinese borders, because it was fairly, you know, it was important trade, but not not as big an economy, say, as, as it was, um, uh, as it is now. Um, what I mean to say is Hong Kong had that role then and has played that role throughout history. To presume that it won't play a similar role going forward is to misunderstand why it was ever important. Yeah. To, to understand the future of it in geopolitical terms, you have to understand which power centre is now guiding the future of Hong Kong. Yeah. Well, undoubtedly, that is mainland China. In terms of trade, why is Hong Kong important? Because it is the nexus between East and West. Yeah. It's the place where a Chinese multinational can do business in Hong Kong dollars, which are fungible to US dollars, effectively pegged, um, and it can use the US dollar for international trade effectively, hedge it. Um, and this is why I don't think that the US dollar will disappear from trade. It, it's not in Chinese interest for that to happen. If Hong Kong is their major portal to the outside world, uh, Chinese multinationals will just count the incoming US dollars, and which are Hong Kong dollars, and then use whatever they need to do to repatriate them to mainland China to pay their taxes and build their factories and do whatever they need to do. Yeah, it, which is important. To which leads me to my the last big question that I want to ask because on YouTube something that we see have been seeing over the last one two years is the buzzword and it's very popular it's like de-dollarization this sure. is the end of the dollar and the world is going to change and uh, while I do think yes I mean the end of the petrodollar and and the emergence of alternative payment system the alternative to a swift system and trading in local currencies all of this is new and it is significant and it will impact uh trade but at the end of the day the important thing is still that goods are moving and the trade is happening uh the way how it happens to me is somehow secondary while i do recognize i mean it gives the the, the us dollar an outsized uh, importance so decreasing that will have domestic impact in the united states although i don't think as huge as as, as people think it will um what is your assessment of this change of <clears throat> of well the role of the dollar and the new systems that are apparently being created at the moment yeah look it's it's really the a, a huge question for finance um i think firstly we have to recognize that what's different about the the you know post bretton woods system we've had with with um the US dollar is, and as you recall, initially it was backed by gold and then Nixon took us off the gold standard formally um, in, I think it was 71, uh, and, and then we moved to fiat money. Um, but but I, I would argue that it was never really a system without an anchor. It's just that the anchor hadn't been thought out very clearly. So what I mean by anchor is a, a standard by which you measure the value of a US dollar. Um, and formerly it was it was gold, the commodity. But if, but if you think about the industrialized West and the post-industrialized West, where large parts of our economy is services, uh, it, it's natural that the anchor is being you know, this relationship between labor cost and the things that labor needs to function, housing, shelter, food. And that's why we've had this sort of CPI management, consumer price inflation, monetary policy, to sort of manage the you know, the value of the fiat currency to some kind of notional standard, which is 2% inflation or whatever. Now, that system is obviously breaking right now. It's breaking in several ways. It's breaking because we're seeing um, cost of living rises that are leading to extreme political unrest in the United States and Europe and e even in Australia. Um, and I think a big reason for that is that the monetary authorities, and I don't wish to um, blame anybody for this, I just want to make an observation that's a review mirror observation from history, is well illustrated by bringing in gold into the, into the story. And I'll tell you a, a short version of this story. It's well illustrated by the Australian experience because the Australian dollar, we're a good big gold producer, you know, um, used to be number two, I think we're number three now, it doesn't matter. Um, but we're historically over the last... 100, 150 years being a big gold producer, usually in the top three globally. Now, we don't base our currency on gold, but for many years, um, the Australian dollar was fairly steady in gold. You know, for a long period in the 90s, it traded roughly $500 an ounce. And so if you looked at the real return on um, for holding gold in Australian dollars, 
it was it was kind of negative, yeah. Um, but all of that changed when China entered the WTO. So they did a small research piece on this, and I'll give you the short version. So what happened after, and it wasn't specifically the entry to WTO, it's just that China's trade with the world increased around that time. Mm-hmm. And not only because of that, in many ways, the reason they entered the WTO was their trade levels rising um, and they needed to normalise. Okay, so if you if you measure the return on holding gold in Australian dollars, not US dollars, um, since about 2002 when China entered the WTO, it's a shocking number. The nominal return is between 8 and 9% per annum. Wow. It's better than a bank account. Mm. So that ought to tell you that something weird is going on, right? How come people putting their money in bank accounts when if they just bought a gold bar and left it in the basement, they would have made more money, right? And also, Australians are, are very, very keen on real estate. Real estate numbers for return on investment is about 10% per annum over the same period, and that ignores the depreciation on holding costs of property, um, you know, because your, your house depreciates, you have to spend money to keep it up, and rates and all the rest of it. So this is very strange. How come... You know, in, in, in sort of hand wavy chart terms, Australian dollar to gold was doing this up until China entered the WTO, and then it did this, and it hasn't stopped doing that. And I think the, the reason, my reason, people will disagree, my reason is that actually we were managing our monetary policy to CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and a big component of the Consumer Price Index in terms of prices was traded goods coming from China, which got cheaper, <laughs> right? Uh, so imagine imagine you're monitoring, ma- ma- managing your interest rate saying, well, as long as inflation is not above 2%, we're fine, yeah? But one part of that basket is doing this because it's the goods coming in from China. And the other part of the basket is doing this, which is housing costs and, and rents, and which translates to labour costs. On average, it stays well, the same. You've distorted your monetary policy. Effectively, what you've done is you've set interest rates too low. And, it, you know, I use that analogy of water. Water finds a way. Economics is similar, yeah? If you set your monetary policy too low in terms of interest rates, what will happen is the system will figure it out um, and you'll see inflation in some other area you weren't watching. And that was house prices. Um, and so now our house prices are unaffordable because actually we ran interest rates too low earlier. But because we ran interest rates too low because we weren't taking account of this China effect, gold noticed that and went up. Um, land noticed that and went up. Real estate, which is built on land, noticed that and went up. Sometime after this... As in, as in, as, as in consumer noticed it and started buying these goods correct. instead of the other ones, which became more, more uh, relatively more exactly. expensive. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what I'm saying is it's fairly clear, I think, when you look at that data and reflect on um, the natural consequences of a changing price structure on both labour and goods is that uh, you were looking at CPI is an anchor to the monetary system. This is the US dollar global system, yeah. And and you are assuming that your monetary levels were set right. Whereas, in fact, in hindsight, you probably had your interest rates too low. So that accelerated financialization and deindustrialization in these countries, mm. the West. But at the same time, it also elevated housing costs and created this stored up political problem of no one can afford to buy a house if they're young. Right. Yeah. At some and, point, and all of these to, problems collide. At some point, we have to talk again because I have this very strong feeling that people uh, seriously misunderstand currencies, and you know, currencies yes. for you as an investor are just another option in it within a portfolio, right? Because yes. you are aware that everything trades in relationship to everything else and it just moves up and down it's not it's not that everything is anchored to the u.s dollar and if the u.s dollar goes down then the others go up it's just not how it works um and in this sense i i really i really think that there's this 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 misunderstanding because people also think that a currency that goes down is a weak currency equals bad but No. no 
a cheap currency just means one thing. It means that goods that come from the outside get more expensive and your own goods to the outside yep. get less expensive, which means that you will probably end up ex starting yep. like reshaping your economic structure in order it's to do more exports. If Pascal, you, you need a Nobel Prize in economics because that Thank is you very true. Much. Thank you very much. But why is it that a lot of people misunderstand this? So actually a cheap US dollar my friends, yeah. is going to be good for the United States because they're going right. to restructure over 10 years and become a, a manufacturing powerhouse again, which they already it's want to do anyway. It's a good tariff. So, it's what I would call a good tariff. It has the tariff, effect yeah. that people want from tariffs. So let's just run that, right? So look at Japan. Of course, the economy is a bit weak right now, but you've got this very weak yen, which has made Japanese manufacturing much more competitive. Yeah, yeah. And they're 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 bringing factories back <laughs> because right. and, you know it, it 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 this is what another fascinating thing. I I'm not sure if it's going to go this way, but if the Japanese yen uh, continues to develop yep. the way it does, um, then we will for the first time have a cheap labor developed nation because yes. the develop the development standard inside Japan is superb, yes. highest level. And if the yen continues tanking, then we're going to have highest level, like developed nation that is going to be, you know, competing yeah. with Vietnam over producing stuff. <laughs> and I don't know the Japanese name for it, but I really want to go up to Japan because I've heard about these, you know, these abandoned homes because everyone wants a new home in Japan and there's these abandoned homes in the country. Um, yeah, the I, population I, is going down, right? So the, yes, house, the houses are that. opening. <laughs> yes, and I look at that and I think, wow, you know, except for the immigration challenge and the lang language challenge. But, you know, with AI now, you can at least use translation to try to, you know, help yourself communicate. Um, but, you know, you've got all the conditions there for, um, you know, eff effectively service workers operating in Japan, probably serving Japanese clients and also global clients as a very attractive destination. Yeah, yeah. The, the only the only thing I must say is like the biggest problem is is regulatory. Uh, the, yes. the 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 foreign population in Japan is below two percent. Yes, of course. And they're not they're not aiming at increasing it. <laughs> so yeah. they have structural barriers. Um, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway, oh, look, they're fabulous thoughts, and uh, I I just want to leave you with that idea that that I think that. Gold is important once more for the reasons I mentioned, because if you're Chinese or Australian, you make more money on holding gold in your basement than you do on a bank account. That's what the Chinese are doing. They're buying it. Australians haven't figured it out yet because they've got an alternative. They go buy housing, <laughs> mm. which, is, which is going to the moon. That's not going to the moon in China anymore. So buy the gold, buy the gold. Um, Australia housing can't go to the moon any closer because no one can afford it. So I think gold yeah. will become popular again. Yeah, but the big risk with gold is, as with any other good, if people stop buying it, then price will go down again. So as long as people That's keep true. buying it, um, anyhow, yeah. um, we, we went a little bit left and right into the yes. on God's green earth. But I hope everybody that you enjoyed this. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Kingsley Jones for your time. Uh, you told me that you have a Substack. Where can people follow you? Oh, uh, so the name of the sub Substack is Savvy Yabby. So a yabby is a little crustacean in Australia. So savvy, S-A-V-V-Y, yabby, Y-A-B-B-Y, dot com. And okay. uh, we have a free newsletter on there and a paid version as well. I will uh, I will put the links into the description. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the, the talk with you, uh, Dr. Jones. See you next time. Thank you very much, Pascal. Pleasure being on.